right, terrific. All right, uh, Ronnie, thank you very much. Welcome to this week's uh, Weha.com Roundtable. I am John Lyons, here as always with the managing editor of Weha.com, Ronnie Newton. Uh, today we have two great guests. We've got the assistant superintendent of the West Hartford Public Schools, Paul Vicinis, and we've got the Board of Education member and vice chair, Dr. Lorna Thomas Farkerson. Uh, so we're going to get into two topics tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about schools uh, and what's going to happen this fall uh, and how we're prepared in the age of COVID-19. And we're also going to talk about uh, really tying in the two issues that we've been focusing on for the last two months. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about race and how uh, curriculum is changing in the West Hartford school system uh, following an edict from Tom Moore uh, about a month and a half ago uh, to, to improve the quality of the education and the, the the honesty and accuracy of the education, particularly as it relates to race. So we've got a couple of really neat topics to cover, but um, we've got a couple of announcements. First, uh, we're very excited. We have a new broadcast partner. And uh, so far, up to this point, we've only been broadcast locally, but we now have a statewide broadcast partner. Uh, for the first time, Connecticut News Junkie will be carrying the show uh, live. So welcome to those of you around the state that are watching. We're very excited to have you. And uh, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to start every week with what I'm calling Ronnie's Notebook, because uh, a lot of news tends to break, particularly on these types of subjects that we talk about. So we're going to kick it off with uh, Ronnie here to tell us what's in her notebook, and then we're going to start uh, the interview. So Ronnie, what, what what's on your mind? Well, my, my notebook's right here, actually. Okay. Uh <laughs> What's on your virtual notebook? My my virtual notebook, which which means I might I might forget things that I'm supposed to mention. Um, but actually, one of the things that um, that everybody should know is that the Board of Education is having a special meeting tomorrow night. That's Friday night or Friday late afternoon, I should say, at four thirty, and we'll be um, officially appointing a new member, Sean Payson, who was unfortunately briefly on the board, um, and because of business reasons, had to resign at the June meeting, um, is going to be replaced by a person, a gentleman named Dr. Jason Oliver Chang, who is a professor of a, um, history and Asian American studies at UConn. And he's got three children who attend Charter Oak International Academy and um, a really fantastic background. Uh, there's a press release on the wehad.com site right now. It's going to be in the newsletter tomorrow. It's on, been shared on several Facebook pages. And if you um, check it out and you can read about Dr. Chang, I think he's, it sounds like he's going to be a great addition to the Board of Education and bring a, a perspective that um, is, is really unique that um, others may not be able to represent at this at this time. Um, so that's one thing that's going on. Um, the Some of the other things that are happening in town, um, actually hot off the presses, the pool is opening tomorrow at Fern. So I'm going to be sharing that information later. And um, concerts are back in Blueback Square. And I'll be sharing that information later as well. Um, the um, So the governor had a press conference this afternoon. And... The numbers um, in Connecticut, I, I think some people continue to be surprised, um, but actually our COVID cases continue to, the, the percentage of people testing positive continues to remain under 1%, which is, I think they think is, is a bit surprising continue, considering that you know, people are starting to travel, um, a lot of businesses have reopened, um, but Today, they reported 114 positive cases out of 11,453 cases. Um, I haven't had a chance to look at what West Hartford's numbers are, but when we have new cases, it's, you know, one or two a day at most. Some days there aren't any. So it's actually still remaining um, remaining positive. Um, hospitalizations dropped by one, and unfortunately, there were nine additional fatalities reported. Um, Josh Gabell, the state um, chief operating officer, said he's going to be looking into those numbers because they have been a little higher the last two days, and um, he's not quite sure whether or not it's, it's a data reporting issue or whether or not there actually are more fatalities. It doesn't always match the day it's reported sometimes there can be a delay we, but one of the other things that was uh, i'm sorry no i'm going to cut you off just we continue okay and even nationally we're being looked at right now as the model of how to manage this i read an article today where they stack ranked 
the states in terms of their performance in handling coronavirus and Connecticut is far and away number one. I mean, um, we're very, very lucky. We have a science-based administration and uh, they seem to be sticking to that missive. So anyway, go on, Ronnie, just, just my little thoughts on that. Yeah. So, well, actually, one of one of the things that um, that mm -hmm. they did say, and in a new statistic that was being shown today in the report, is the age group that is showing the most positive cases now, and it is twenty to twenty nine, followed by yeah. thirty to thirty nine. So, um, there at at this point, it looks like it could be due to you know the fact that people in that age group are a little bit less yeah. or a little bit more willing to take risks and maybe gathering, um, you know, hanging out with their friends, maybe going to parties. Um, so, you know, that'll be something to, to explore a little further on the state level. Um, but, you know, in, in general, in West Hartford, there's really been a very strong effort to get people to wear their masks, um, particularly in the center. Tonight, there is a group from the fire department. They're on bikes. They're out there talking to people who are not wearing masks and handing them out to people who may not have one with them but are willing to wear them. Um, and one thing that um, Mike Sinsigali, who is the um, fire marshal and also the director of emergency operations, has said that um, a lot of times when a member of the fire department or the police department will approach someone who's not wearing a mask, they quickly put it out of the pull it out of their pocket and put it on. Um, they realize that, you know, oh, yeah, maybe I should be wearing this. Um, and I, I shouldn't smile when I say that it's actually it's very, very serious. And I think the majority of people are taking it as seriously as they should be. Um, one of the other major discussions on the governor's press conference today, and they had Dr. Scott Gottlieb on there, who is the former um, FDA commissioner and um, a Connecticut resident. They were talking about, and, and has been very involved in the reopen Connecticut and the um, plans to bring kids back to school. They were talking about bringing kids back to school this fall, and, and this will luckily segue into the two guests that we have tonight to, to speak about. But um, Scott Gottlieb said that as of now, the way things are now, he trusts that the state is doing the right thing, approaching this the right way, and he is comfortable sending his own children back to school based on what the state and his own school district, and I'm actually not sure where he where he lives. I think it's um, in Fairfield County some way, somewhere, but he's comfortable sending his kids back to school. Um, West Hartford has a survey that families are asked to complete by tomorrow, and uh, maybe um, we can find out a little bit more about what people in town are are thinking based on their responses thus far, and uh, you know what what we think things could be looking like in gosh, how many weeks? Six. I know it's going to be quick. We we do have our first ever poll, Ronnie, running. For, uh, for the round table uh, over on neighbors and friends um, just for technical issues. We had to put it over there. Patty set it up for us. And there is a poll asking uh, folks who are watching, uh, click over that page and it's pinned. So you won't have any trouble finding it. Um, and and uh, let us know what your thoughts are on various scenarios in terms of your age kids. Uh, she's given a lot of options. And uh, so let us know your thoughts and we'll talk about it a little later in the show. Uh, but you want to head over there now and uh, just check it out and give us your, give us your thoughts. Uh, you know, select what what you think is is right, and uh, you know we'll, we'll kick this off. Uh, Paul Vicinis. Paul, um, obviously, um, I would have to think career wise, it's probably one of the biggest decisions Tom and you and the other um, assistant superintendent and and the board of ed are going to have to make uh, with respect to what happened. So. Walk us through from a 50,000 foot level. What What's the plan now? And then we'll give you some what ifs without getting too crazy here. Sure. Thanks, John. And, and thank you, Ronnie, for the opportunity. And hello, Lorna, as well. I'll talk to you soon, I'm sure. Um, in terms of the, the decision to return, uh, absolutely a huge decision is, you know, it, it probably second only to the decision that that we had to close back in March and uh, and made that announcement just prior to the whole statewide shutdown, um, and we've learned uh, quite a bit, uh, quite a bit in that time since since we closed. You know, when we when we started this, um, and and in we we had dramatic concerns watching the news. You know, in China, watching the news in Italy as to what would the impact look like over here, and uh, 
And while it certainly has been devastating for for um, individual families, and, and I know families who have been touched by this um, and the loss that it created, um, the, the one positive thing mm-hmm. is Connecticut's role as a leader and, and really how we've gone to the protective measures and been able to mitigate so much of the risk. So we are, you know, we've said that this, this decision to reopen, uh, it's something that we were leaning forward with before, um, before the state had put it out there. We, we made our claim as a district that we see this as a, as a huge issue, as an equity issue in terms of being able to provide education for all of our children and, and watching what happened in the three months as hard as we work. Uh, you know, the students that kind of fell behind and became more disengaged, uh, whether that was due to economic reasons, their parents had to work, they, as as older uh, adolescents might have had to help, uh, or maybe they were watching children, uh, or maybe just we didn't have uh, the supervision or the support at home because families were working or or were ill, that, you know, it was driving, it was driving uh, some some gaps in participation that we were very concerned about. Um, we, we did just amazing outreach. I credit our clinicians, our assistant principals, our social workers who, who did go knock on doors and made phone calls. Our director, Eric Dency, our director of security was out there doing wellness checks along with um, in, you know our, our school resource officers and others. Uh, so we're really, really uh, felt like this was an important decision and we did feel like Connecticut's been such a leader nationally in terms of our response that that we hopefully will have the conditions. We feel like we have them now. We feel like we hope that we will continue to have them in the fall for safe opening. And, um, you know, safety and, and student health and community health mm-hmm. remains number one. That will drive all of our decisions. But uh, the protective measures, the wearing of the masks, the um, social distancing and us keeping an appropriate distance whenever possible, um, the washing of hands more frequently. These are the very, very simple things that if we are paying attention to, um, we can we can uh, be able to find a new normal with schools and be able to conduct business as many of our local community businesses have demonstrated. Um, and it's and I think to Ronnie's point, as she was talking about, you know, where do numbers spike and things like this? Um, it it's you know. As a school, we feel that we can do our part because we feel that we can get our teachers, we feel that we can get the practices in place in our classrooms, in the physical environment. We feel that we can work with our students. We, we need it to be a community. We need to be comprehensive. It can't end at 2.30 when kids get off the bus. It has to be, you know, we have to maintain some some diligence with it at home in order, in order for this to be successful. Uh, but we're excited to go back. Um, the teachers, are excited to see students. There is anxiety and apprehension, but in terms of getting to the business of education, um, you know, it's it's a big decision, but I think it's the right decision, and I'm and I'm glad that we're on the path. Talk about talk about some of the options that uh, parents with school age K through 12. What are some of the options? I know a survey went out. Discuss, uh, you know, share with us a little bit what was on the survey. What are some of their options? Uh, my, sure. my youngest just graduated Hall, so unfortunately I'm not in that group anymore, but um, what, are, what are some of the options parents face? Absolutely, so um, we put out uh, a survey and, and uh, you know, the state in, in the plan that we will submit to the state uh, toward the end of next week, we'll be uh, having a board meeting on Tuesday to showcase the plan to the public. Um, you know, First and foremost, we we have a plan uh, where we're asked by the state to bring all students back to school on a regular basis, but provide an online option within that plan for any families where students themselves may be in a high risk uh, population due to a health concern or, or something, or loved ones in the home may be in that high risk, or maybe the family just feels based on, you know, based on their own readiness and their own preparedness, to, to have, you know, have things returned to normal, maybe, maybe they're not ready. So that's a family choice. And that's essentially what the survey asked. Um, it was uh, other than some, you know, some simple demographic questions to connect you to a school and a grade level. 
Uh, the questions were, are, I feel that I'm ready to go back to school in the fall, and that's my choice for my child. I feel that uh, I would like to stay at home or I'm undecided. And uh, the early results from that and, and pretty much the results as they continue to come in today um, showed that, you know, there, there is a significant majority of the West Hartford community that wants to come back. Um, we're, we're somewhere between, you know, say slightly uh, more than 5% of families who do have a situation. And we totally respect that. There's not any judgment uh, in terms of, uh, you know, folks making the right decision for, for their circumstances. Uh, slightly more than 5% who are um, saying that at this point in time with the information that they have, that they were thinking that they would do at home learning online. Um, and then there's, you know, another five to 10% who are undecided. And we're, uh, that will be the work in the coming week as this survey closes. And I would encourage anyone listening, if they haven't had the opportunity to respond, to go ahead onto our website at whps.org. And uh, you'll see a link to that survey right away when you go on um, and respond to that. Hopefully by tomorrow, our schools will be engaged in um, next week when that survey uh, time is up. Uh, to go ahead and to uh, begin to do the outreach to any folks who um, did not have the opportunity to respond. And they'll also certainly after and probably after the board presentation and we have this uh, public release of what the specifics of our plan are, uh, do follow up with uh, those folks who indicated that they were undecided so that we can have you know, a solid plan for each and every individual student um, in the district. So one one follow up and Ronnie, I'm not trying to dominate. I'll I'll hand it over to you after this follow. -up. No, I'm taking notes. <laughs> okay, okay, good, terrific. Uh, so Ronnie's uh, double tasking here. She's working on a story mm -hmm. about, about this. No, as well. just just uh, just uh, just gathering background information. Yeah. Um, so uh, Kim Beth, who's uh, an active mom around town, um, she she makes a comment here in the chat. Very important to give credit as well to the teachers who went above and beyond to engage students. So my question about the teachers, talk to me about their role in this process currently. What type of feedback are you getting? Is there a lot of communications? What's the how's the union responding? Um, what what are you seeing with that? Absolutely. So. Teachers are obviously just critical to every success that we have in the district. You know, it's nice to sit in my office and and and, and hear the compliments from the board or the community, but it's it's nothing uh, nothing that I can take credit for. It's 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 the hard work of our teachers and the degree to which they stepped up in this uh, was amazing. We we turned the whole district in, in in three days' time back in March online, and they did a phenomenal job. Um, and just the flexibility and everything else. What we did to engage them in the plan was following that before and throughout the end of the year, um, myself, uh, Ann McKernan, my director of secondary ed, Carrie Jones, my director of elementary ed, uh, the principals and the assistant principals and department supervisors, we hosted meetings. Um, we went to virtual faculty meetings um, and we kind of got all the lessons learned and all the best practices from the teachers. We hosted listening sessions. Um, we, I, I can tell you we had plenty of sort of folks who reached out to us individually um, and gave us input to these plans. And we put out um, for the teachers before they left for the summer um, questionnaires, question banks, things that they would want us to know that, that would help to inform what we would assume to be an online 2.0 plan, you know, the second version, uh, should we go to that. Um, when we had the decision to come back to school in earnest, um, we of course started working and there's a whole set of state guidance that pretty much maps out much of what we're doing, but we've had ongoing conversations with all of the neighboring districts, um, uh, to kind of compare our plans and to steal good ideas and share good ideas. Um, and we've developed, as we've developed those plans, there's major lines of effort. Mine is under curriculum and instruction. Uh, Dr. Andy Morrow, my colleague, uh, has one uh, that's related to health and safety. Uh, Dr. Rosina Haskins has one related to community outreach. Dr. Nelson uh, has one related to social emotional uh, well wellness. And, um, and then Rick Ledwith, our director of human resources, runs a committee related to how we'll uh, 
kind of coordinate with staff and the needs of staff and and all of those pieces with uh, absence policies and, and things of that nature. And on each of those committees, we've engaged a number of teachers. Um, on my committee particularly, you know, the, you, you had talked about the union. Um, I worked with the union president and, and she uh, pretty much gave me the, uh, a list of teacher representatives at each level uh, who could uh, support not only my need to get input from an elementary, middle school, and high school perspective, but then also have the ear of the teachers group as a whole. And similarly, all of the other uh, committees have, have a number of different um, teachers that are involved, as well as uh, potentially board members, community members, um, and, and things of this nature. Um, myself, uh, I have a weekly meeting with our union president. Uh, teachers union where we go through kind of the list of what the plans are, what's happening uh, in terms of our progression. She'll feed me some questions. I'll feed her information and, and get her direct sense. Um, and that's, you know, that's the way, that's the biggest way that we've been engaging our teachers. Um, I had, I had uh, four hours of meetings today, one, one with each level, elementary, middle, and high school. Um, where we had teacher representatives on the line giving up their time in the summer to provide a specific feedback on the proposals as they exist today um, and taking that feedback to kind of reshape it in preparation mm -hmm. for a presentation to the board next week. Which is a great segue actually to, to um, bring Lorna into the discussion. I, I know the Board of Education is having, um, doesn't usually meet in the summer, but is having a meeting on Tuesday night. Um, what do you anticipate the board is going to discuss at that meeting? And what, what's the role of the Board of Education in helping craft this plan for the administration? Certainly, first of all, thank you so much. An honor to be here. I, uh, in regard to you saying that typically the board does not meet over the summer, that certainly is so with the exception of this, uh, this summer. Uh, certainly with the unique circumstances we are under. And so uh, the frequency of us meeting um, and uh, discussing has certainly been more than usual, but all for very important reasons. In terms of the role of the Board of Education, as we know overall, it's in regard to policy making and certainly the budget uh, making, but all of that is governed by wanting to support and prioritize the wellness of the students and the young people who are in our town, which also means having a collaboration with the family and the community at large. And so for that reason, in response to unrolling the plans moving forward, as Paul made mention to, there are several different committees that have been meeting and each board member has served on one of those committees, uh, really to not only contribute in terms of talking, but more so to hear what others are saying and speaking about. And so it has been an approach where it's not a one shot decision, the types of, of possibilities that were presented and shared with us in April have certainly changed from where we are now. Um, it is very good and promising to hear from what you made reference to, to the most recent press conference, that the numbers are going down. However, we still have to take into account what that may mean for next month, and certainly the impact of the pandemic and the, the effect it has caused on so many uh, communities, in particular our community and, and our children, um, because of that. And I'm sure we're going to discuss more of that as, as the interview or that is the discussion uh, continues. But we know that COVID-19 has unveiled many, many, many challenges, many, many inequities that have been longstanding, but their presence has become even more glaring. And so whatever plans we take moving forward, we have to take those pieces into account. So does the does the board need to approve the um, district's plan or or is it more of like a giving consensus kind of a collaboration providing some ideas and and then it's really up to the administration to make the decision it is it's a collective effort in terms of supporting whatever initiatives are presented and um, we certainly um, give um, uh, credence and and um, recognize the role of our superintendent and how he certainly connects with the staff that assert support and work with him and the work that's done behind the scene that is presented to us at the Board of Ed meeting. And so 
with that, we'll have discussions. And with those discussions, it will either um, raise questions or, or have discussion in terms of what else may be explored, or it may say, you know, yes, we, we, we support the plans moving forward. But ultimately, whatever decisions are made, the execution of that is, is led by our superintendent, Tom Moore, and his executive team. And certainly the teachers, they play a vital role in carrying out the execution of that as well. And we are, we do these every week and already we've had more questions on this one, I think, than we've had on any other one. In fact, maybe most of the others combined. Um, and so, um, so Lorna, um, I, I just, I'm trying to think where to pivot here. Cause I, let me, let me scroll up and I'll just do these in order. Um, all right. So for both of you, there's concern, um, Laura, Rebecca, uh, comments that I guess the survey has been available for several weeks. And there's concern, kind of a two-part question here, that number one, a lot of people completed their surveys early before there was much awareness of what was happening in, or what, it, what just wasn't happening in Florida, Texas, Alabama, Georgia, California. So there's some trepidation there. And then the other thing is recent surveys have shown that uh, approximately nationally, 65% of parents have grave concern sending their kids back to school the fall so i guess can you can you talk you know either one of you or both of you talk to that uh, to those uh, comments sure I'm, I'm happy to start i mean the, the first thing i would say first and foremost um in the survey itself it does talk about if you you know if you change your mind to reach out to us but one of the things i would say is if if any parent that's out there that's listening has had a change of heart in any way shape or form um and i believe the survey has only been out for you know, I think this is the second week. Um, I, I could be wrong on that. It could be a total of three, but it's certainly not a long time. Um, if they go ahead, we do have some duplicates in there. So I don't know if that's evidence of folks who have changed their mind or, or folks that have simply, you know, sometimes you hit it and you're not sure if it went through and you submit it twice. But we're scrubbing those um, responses and where people have given an affirmative response in either direction. I want to attend. I want to stay home. Uh, we're going to go with the most recent thing that was listed there. Um, and then obviously, as I said, we're gonna be reaching out to anyone who was uncertain at the time. And when we, when we are, that, that's gonna form the basis so that we can know, okay, what, how do we staff the online part and how do we staff the in-school part? And once we have schedules, uh, we'll be sending out that communication so that you know, folks will get that confirmation of, hey, this is the last thing that I kind of indicated as my intent. Um, Relative to national surveys, I'll simply say, um, it was not a surprise to us that Connecticut survey uh, and West Hartford specifically, our survey results, our initial results that are showing, you know, between 85 to potentially upwards to 90% of our families um, do feel comfortable returning and, and understandably somewhere between uh, 10 to 15% of our families do have situations that makes them uncomfortable and that's totally understandable. It's not surprising that that doesn't match national statistics because as you said, John, Connecticut's stats don't match national statistics. We're, we're leading, um, I saw a comment in the chat about, you know, and, and it's on another question about the importance of masks. And, and the thing I say, masks are, are one very important piece among, among a, a, a coordinated system of protective measures. And when you're doing all of those things and when you're doing them comprehensively, um, not just at school, not just when someone's looking, as I, I, I heard, uh, I think Ronnie say, um, that's when it makes a difference. That's when you can really reap those benefits of those protections. And so um, we feel like that we can put that into place at the schools and we feel like Connecticut and West Hartford as a community, um, you know, can, can have the vigilance to maintain those outside of school hours that's gonna keep us safe as a community. And, and, and the questions continue to pile in, and I'm trying to scan them and listen to you as well. So I apologize if I ask you to repeat something or if I miss something. But um, what, uh, where, where was the question? Um, oh, I'm sorry, I had the question and I just scrolled out of it. I'm gonna ask you to bear with me for a second. Well, why don't, why don't we ask this question about whether or not the, the teachers as well as any other stakeholders have been surveyed in addition to the parents um, and or guardians of the children in school sure we're we're that's that's a stage that's upcoming in terms of getting feedback from teachers um, I do know that 
uh, not necessarily a survey that's gone out that says, are you coming back or not coming back? But there have been separate communications from our HR department and from our union leadership um, out to teachers sort of indicating um, if you know today that you have, uh, let's say, just for example, um, a compromised health condition that that makes it unsafe for you to come and, you, and you're planning not to return to reach out to our human resources department and talk about it um, so, so that they can be made aware. And I'm very aware from talking to the teacher reps that are on my committee uh, and from the union president herself that she's aware that there are some teachers that are kind of waiting to see the unveiling of this plan. And so um, once that's become public um, and the board has the opportunity to weigh in on it and help influence it uh, on Tuesday, and then once that final product is filed with the state uh, at the end of this uh, next week, um, that'll be the, the, the opportunity, I'm sure, where our HR department will be providing teachers with, whether it's a survey or whatever the guidance is for their communication channels, because some of that's going to go directly to HR relative to like HIPAA and other things. It's not, um, it's not something uh, that we would necessarily be telling them they have to go through a principal or anyone else if they're disclosing personal health information. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the the uh, question, a couple of questions come in, one regarding mask uh, usage and requirements for the school year. And then another one is, is there any discussion, um, this is for Lorna, has the Board of Ed discussed a, a hybrid method for, in this case, high schools? This is from Jennifer Evans, as some subjects have to be online learning are harder to lead online versus others. For example, honors Chinese might be tougher to do online as opposed to gym. We have not normally um, discussed that because one of the pieces with with the Board of Education is whenever we have meetings, they have to be announced and they have to be formalized. So the last time we met was in uh, June or July. And so the meeting we have on Tuesday will be very telling in terms of what's presented to us of the options. And then earlier on, uh, back in April and May, when different ideas were thrown around in different discussions, that was a piece that was brought up, a hybrid method. Um, whether that is what is going to be presented again on Tuesday, we shall see. Uh, but I would not rule that out. I think we have to be open-minded in terms of what's the best way to have our students return to school in a safe way. And that will um, require looking at different um, options. And I look forward to hearing what our executive team and, and superintendent have are prepared to share with us. And we, and we will uh, present a hybrid uh, as part of the statewide plan to the board on Tuesday. Um, that is part of the statewide requirement that we include um, that we include a hybrid uh, plan uh, for the potential, and I see it in another in another question for the potential of a localized spike to where um, part of the state might get closed down or or you know into a partial closure versus the entire state. Um, that is a Department of Public Health call when when those kinds of things happen to answer the question. Um, and, but that, you know, it's important uh, relative to the hybrid, the charge of the state of Connecticut from the governor's office is for all schools to reopen and have the ability for all students to attend every day. So um, the primary plan that we're going to bring to the board is here's how we reopen with the option for families who want to um, remain at home to be able to remain at home. That is, that is what all school districts are charged with and I'm aware Know of some early plans that have gone into the state that kind of somehow missed that fine print and uh and the state gave them you know feedback to uh make amendments to their plan is there a scenario here in town uh, where and i don't want you to speculate so if i'm if i'm stepping too far into speculation stop me where a school could be closed while others remain open or would it be a uniform decision if, you know, heaven forbid there's a spike? Uh, honestly, I would be speculating to answer, but you know, let's just say, <clears throat> if I if I were pushed on an answer today, I could I could picture a theoretical possibility. But once once the important quite follow up questions come, okay, what would those conditions be, and what would it look like? Um, I could not I could not venture. I, all of that guidance, honestly, um, would be helped and informed by the Department of Public Health, as opposed to Paul Vicenis or, 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 or Lorna or Tom or anyone sort of saying, this is what we think we're going to do. 
it's my understanding though that the the plan is you know particularly in the elementary schools where the students are going to be cohorted if there is a positive case that classroom might be basically shut down for a couple of days um those kids kept at home sanitizing done is that is that a accurate understanding um that that i have i can't speak to how many days and what will that look like and it becomes so situational because um let's be honest uh there's going to be a positive case somewhere in west hartford tomorrow and uh, we we had a positive case uh you know we're aware of of folks you know who have tested positive on staff but school's not in session so a lot of those positive cases we recognize are going to happen um outside of the school district through casual contact and other social settings um and then the question is okay in the school setting if that's if that's an adult or if that's a student um we will do the contract tracing i'm sure that there'll be some kind of short term we have to figure out what this means but we have to look into the individual circumstances um i'm aware uh in other cases you know outside of education where a person has been in contact with someone and they've gone to the hospital and they said i feel like i need to be tested and i feel like this and they start to talk to them and say okay well well what happened well i have a friend and they you know i saw them yesterday i was in the room with them and they had covid and you know the follow up questions okay well were you more than 6 feet away for more than 10 minutes were you wearing a mask and uh you know persons can be sent home persons can be admitted for testing just based on what those individual circumstances are so certainly our protocols and and those will be in our plan um and honestly it's not part of my part I'm, my part's the curriculum and instruction so mm -hmm. i don't want to go too far on a limb and misspeak um but that that will be well articulated and it's and on that committee that health and safety committee not only do we have you know our administrators and community members but we have um health professionals that are helping to inform that and then we have the direct guidance uh that we get in concert with uh, the department of public health so so on that note I, i definitely do not want to give the second topic short shrift and we've blown through 40 minutes here really quickly um so paul i'm going to i'm going to pivot you know, your role as curric uh head of curriculum which you just mentioned um and hello to your was that your wife who just walked by <laughs> yes it was hello to your wife uh, um can you talk to us a little bit about um uh, tom tom uh you know laid down the gauntlet here uh tom Moore, uh superintendent of the schools here in west hartford probably 6 weeks ago uh early June uh when he said you know we're going to really uh we're going to be proactive in in our curriculum as it relates to race racial history um talk talk a little bit about what he what's he done what is being done um what what's happening on that uh, on that topic absolutely and thanks for making this uh, this is such an important topic and and you know I'll, I'll try to just segue it with the covid um this this whole global pandemic is happening during a period of time where there was just some dramatic social unrest and upheaval um in and along this you know race relations in this in this whole piece um and it it forms a part of our plan you know we we had a plan before the pandemic tom came out and he talked uh well with the pandemic tom came out and talked about this needs we need to be taking a lead on this we need to simply do better um we layer on to this a whole uh, piece of social isolation that comes in with the pandemic and the need for social emotional learning in the plan so we're we're taking that social emotional learning piece and and that need for a strong anti-racism curriculum um and and we're looking at how we merge those in our return to school so that we can set the conditions so that students know that they're safe so that students know that we care about them and so that we do honestly uh the be a better job and the best possible job uh you know to to have all students uh become healthy happy edu well educated citizens i would say that as a district west hartford um has been a significant leader in this work this larger work uh that we frame under cultural competence um we have more than 5 years ago uh had an assured professional learning experience 
for all staff in and around the topic of unconscious bias and, and racial understanding and identity. Um, we have uh, created systems to include uh, a position of the Director of Diversity Advancement, um, Dr. Rosina Haskins, who has just been an incredible leader in this work for a number of years. Um, and we've, we've had so many things, but the truth of the matter is when, when we sit back and we look at kind of the state of our country and, and how folks are treating each other, whether that's locally or whether that's nationally, um, we know that we simply have to do more and we have to do better. And so what we're trying to do is add an anti-racism layer to our cultural competence work. And we're trying to be uh, very proactive. Um, I can talk about a number of efforts uh, that, that are underway and uh, that we continue to work on. And we have, a, in, terms of, um, in terms of your big question, how do we kind of communicate that out? Uh, we have a publication called uh, Connections that's a, a quarterly newsletter um, and our entire uh, upcoming edition is devoted to this topic, talking about our, uh, our statement and our position, a summary of things that we have done, areas of need that we still see and our commitments and some of our lines of effort to things that we plan to do moving forward. Um, I just wanna pause and see if there's a follow up or if Lorna wants, has a jump in. Uh, but I definitely want to Lorna. Lorna's thoughts on this as well. Um, Lorna, talk about it from your personal perspective, if I could, if I could be so bold to ask, and also from the Board of Ed uh, perspective. Sure. Uh, I, if I may start with the Board of Ed perspective. Yeah. That's okay. yeah. And that certainly is um, wanting to support the initiatives that are being talked about in terms of having a more anti-racist approach to things. But I do want to say the conversation has been had, and, and Paul alluded to this, it was prior to COVID-19. I, I vividly recall at the opening convocation that we had last year, and uh, Superintendent Tom Moore in his comments speaking about the realities of racism. And he reflected on his son's uh, travel abroad and, um, and his time in South Africa and the learning he had with apartheid and just relating that to the different inequities that are still present in this country. So the seed was planted then Unfortunately, what has transpired as of late has made that seed sprout to become a weed. And um, as Paul made reference to the talk, the conversation, the advocacy work in terms of multiculturalism and being more culturally aware and competent has been longstanding. However, we know that that's not enough. It's one thing to be culturally aware, but if we see, if we are aware of blatantly racist acts that are happening and we are silent, then we are complicit and we are colluding with the problem. And I think that's the piece. Now I'm transitioning into the personal aspect of it, personally, because clearly I'm a woman of color and this is not something I can choose to be involved with. I am involved with it, whether I like it or not. And I think that's something that's going to be so important with our allies, recognizing that this is not a short-term commitment this is not something that you can decide to be a part of now and maybe not tomorrow. And the purpose for the word anti-racist speaks volumes because if someone says, well, I'm not a racist or I don't believe in and support those views, that's more of a passive approach. But when you say you're anti-racist, that's when you see wrongdoings, you actively speak out and work towards changing that for the better. And that certainly relates to our school systems because that's where the foundation is led. But let's keep it real, let's be honest. The learning does not just happen within the walls of a school building. The learning happens before a child first goes to school, and it certainly happens after hours and once they graduate from school. And that's why this is a charge that really needs to be community-led. We need our community to be involved in this pandemic. And as we do know, very glad that West Hartford has recognized through a recent proclamation on Juneteenth that racism is a pandemic. And that is something that we are dealing with in addition to pandemic of COVID-19 racism is a long-standing one and it's impacting all of us so we have to do more and i am glad to be a part of a school system that is speaking up and recognizing that we need to do more and making those actions in doing so i i love dr farkinson's passion when she speaks about this um it's inspiring and it it you know the the issues that we have in american publication a uh, public education around this are, are just systemic, you know, and uh, a lot of this work falls, uh, oftentimes falls under, say, social studies. Uh, it's the natural curricular connection for some of the work. Um, and the difficulty being that 
you know, in a high school setting specifically, or, or even, even when we look pre-K through 12, a lot of the education is focused around U.S. history. And the African-American experience within U.S. history is not, uh, you know, is, is often the, st the story of, this, of struggle and the civil rights movement. And it paints, it's, it's this concept of privilege that if you don't really step back and think about it, you don't realize that as, um, as a student of color, as you're going through your educational experience, um, the portrayal and the historical figures that you learn about are reflecting um, those efforts and those achievements related to struggle, whereas your peers sitting next to you um, those historical figures that they're that they're learning about are are placing them and and have these subliminal identity messages uh, about you know achievements and other things that don't come with with the the same chains of uh, oppression that others have had and so we're trying to rewrite that script um, within our curricular uh, programming to say how can we ensure that. Um, not only do we have um, all voices and, and lesser represented voices being, being heard in our curriculum and in the exposure of content, but how can we ensure that through a process of what kind of what we call uh, mirrors and windows, that we are providing the stories and the, of achievement um, so that no matter who I am, no matter what my cultural background is, I've got some form of a personal connection with, that I'm reading about, that I'm hearing about, that makes me see myself in the curriculum and see myself in positive lights to understand the contributions of, of my cultural heritage, which if, if we simply go back in time and if we had the breadth of you know, being able to teach anything and everything we want, we can point to, to any historical period and all of the various contributions of so many people of, of a wide, wide variety of backgrounds. But, um, you know, when you study U.S. history and even look at the, the curricular documents that are, that are given to us by the state, here's what you have to kind of do. Um, it, it's a very narrow focus. And so we're trying to widen that lens. Um, and then to Lorna's point, we're trying to add to that um, the, the very proactive measures of anti-racism and calling it out where we see it and looking for it in, in our systems and our structures and our and really our everyday conversations and make sure that we're educating people. And how, how quickly can something like that happen? I mean, this is, you know, it's not like racism is new, but there's definitely a, a very renewed, clear, I shouldn't say clear, but a renewed, strong focus on it and a, a strong feeling that something needs to be done and it needs to be done now. But how quickly can those changes to the curriculum be made? And, and um, things like, you know, hiring of, of more teachers of color to reflect the diversity in sure. the, the population. How, how quickly can that happen? So, um, you know, everything in education, I would say, moves more slowly than we would ever want it. But the good news is, you know, this is work um, in terms of adjusting that lens, uh, this is work that we've been engaged in for uh, well over five years. Um, we've done the work of identifying points of tangency within some of our curriculum. Certainly we looked um, and we have a rewrite happening this summer at our middle school levels, which is a regional history approach in those grade levels. Uh, we have uh, ongoing work uh, at the at the eighth grade and tenth grade level, looking at our U.S. history to identify further points of tangency and identify those stories, uh, we've done significant resource adoption at the elementary level over the last three years to identify uh, texts that celebrate um, and and provide positive examples, whether they're historical figures or whether they're even just. Uh, you know, children's literature, nonfiction, you're reading, you're reading about families and, and the main characters, you know, are, uh, represent diversity. And you have to look deeper than just do the characters represent diversity. You have to look, what are the roles of those characters? Are they the protagonists? Are they, you know, are they in, you know, are they in um, professions? Is the, if, if I have a book on nursing, do I see 
or, or nursing or, or healthcare and doctors? Do I see persons of color that are that are doctors, that are teachers, um, you know, or if I look at some older print materials, they might show some diversity, but they didn't position people. And those are very subliminal messages that I don't think, you know, if we're not paying attention, we're not seeing. Um, you asked about the teacher hiring. This has been something that's written into our board goals for a number of years. And it, it is, you know, you think about the tenure of a teacher, um, it's 30 years uh, for a retirement. So the teachers change much, much more slowly than the students do. And we've become increasingly diverse, but um, we have demonstrated incremental growth among the diversity of our teaching staff every year for six continuous years. It's slow. It increased. It amounts to only a two and a half percent increase. But if you look at an, a different lens, we've uh, we've had like a net uh, a net change of twenty four teachers. Uh, nineteen of those are teachers of color. Um, nineteen among twenty four teachers who are in minority race classifications. That's during a period of time that there was a net decrease of one teacher. So, so over the six year period, we've uh, we've we've brought in a net of 24 minority teachers, 19 of color, um, and we've lost in that same period of time, say, uh, 20, 25 uh, teachers who would classify as white. So those are measurable gains. Those are real people that we can point to and, and real increases, but we're a staff of nearly a thousand. So it, it takes a significant amount of time to turn this large ship. So, so, if I may, just, yep. just wanted to, but I just want to share a recent communication had with Dr. Rosina Haskins, who, as we know, is the Director of Diversity Advancement. And in the course of communication, I just want to quote her words because I think it speaks volumes again when we talk about curriculum and how soon we may or may not be able to implement it. It's not just about the teaching of the curriculum, it's about how it is taught. And this is what she said. The, the biggest point that I like to emphasize is that how we teach is as important as what we teach. While curriculum can be rewritten to correct harmful inaccuracies, misleading history, and intentional omissions about the African-American and Black experience, it is important and respectful for educators, educators to attain the knowledge, skills, and competencies for equity and anti-racist pedagogy. So I think that is really important because, again, it's not just about us teaching at the students. It's a, it's a joint process. We're teaching with the students. And that may mean some educators learning some pieces on their own accord. And that's important because the way that you teach can emphasize and influence rather how well someone will receive it. If you say, this is great, that's entirely different from this is great. And so those pieces are important to recognize with any curriculum development. It's important to recognize how the teacher is teaching. And Paul, how do you how do you how do you stay on top of that? I mean, I think that's a really important point she brings up. How how do you know how how these folks are handling the kids in the classroom to that level? Well, we've had uh, you know it's it's really through ongoing professional development, ongoing staff conversations. I, I would you know I, I see some comments in the chat about some of the amazing things that are happening with our staff. Um, book clubs. Uh, we've had workshops. We've had folks. We have we have. Uh, an incredible team of dedicated teachers as part of our equity and diversity council um, that have helped to lead this work. And then it's colleagues partnering with colleagues, helping them, um, you know, how do you have this tough conversation? How do I, as a, as a, as a, as a white male, um, have credibility and go in and, and try to have a conversation with adolescents and backgrounds, you know, that are different. Um, you know, I know I can do it with math or with social studies. How do I have the real personal conversation? Um, so we've got some great teacher leadership. We've invested in them. Uh, we've done a significant amount of professional development that's uh, a lot deeper for folks that are helping lead that, sending them out to things. And then we had uh, just an amazing um, <clears throat> set of assured professional learning for everyone on this topic, all teachers paraeducators, teaching assistants, um, this past election day that Dr. Haskins uh, coordinated uh, across the district level. Um, the work, you know, the work continues to 
to grow. Uh, we now have a, a parent community, the EDI, where our parents have wanted to be more engaged. And so we've helped work with them to define structures to, to really uh, let that work kind of seep out in, into the larger and broader community. And now we're taking stock of all the various, we have several different community organizations. And I know that Dr. Haskins has been working closely. Uh, they, have, they have missions that are very well aligned to each other. So how do we get them communicating and create some synergy um, so that so that we can that we can all work collectively? That's terrific, Paul. Thank you. Um, I, I want to just give a quick apology. There's a very minor background technical issue that Ronnie and I have been trying to resolve for about 35 minutes. It's not affecting the broadcast and it's not affecting what people are seeing online, but it's a minor technical issue. I think we can resolve it after we go off air. Um, I apologize if at, at any moment I've seemed distracted, but we've been trying to troubleshoot this thing for since about 25 minutes past the hour. So my apologies. Um, so we are we are up against it. Um, Lorna, let me let me go to you. Any last comments or any last thoughts before we uh, we sign off here? I, I'm glad we're having this conversation. And I know that you've had other roundtable discussions touching on race as well. And and I encourage for these conversations to continue. Certainly, the tragic murder of George Floyd has sparked a lot of charge and a lot of people to talk and to discuss. But we need to recognize that the need to be involved should not just happen at that level of tragedy. Uh, the need to become involved needs to happen at any level of racism. And that's, again, why we refer to systemic racism, the different systems of it, where racism is so embedded in the way things are done that it just is a part of the process. And we need to change that process. So I encourage those who are listening, if you can see a situation uh, where, let's say, you um, see someone is being approached in a, in a rude or, or a racist type way, to, to not hold back in acknowledging that. Now, not at all saying everyone go out there and put yourself at risk or be confrontational with someone. No, not at all. But I think that when we see things that happen, when we see people who are being mistreated, that it's important for us as citizens, as human beings, regardless of what color you are, to speak up and speak out about that. Because the way that things have been escalating as of late, it's, um, it's beyond unfortunate. Uh, I've shared before a very close family friend of our family, the Abernathy family. We know the Abernathys are the close friends of, the, of Dr. King. And um, Juanita Abernathy was my other mom. I went to Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. And her family was my other home for weekends and then celebrating, um, getting away for different holidays. And um, the contributions that they made during the Civil Rights Movement to see their marches, to read about their marches, to see their pictures, and to see that we're doing that again, yes, we can say how far we've come but we certainly are reminded of how far we still have to go. And that level of involvement and commitment happens from every level of our society, every neighborhood, every neighbor. So thank you again for having this conversation and let's just say, let's keep it coming. Dr. Just, oh, sorry, Ronnie, go ahead. I, I, just, I just wanted to say one quick thing before, before we go to Paul. I'd love to welcome anyone who would like to submit an op-ed to weha.com. We'd really like to encourage the continuation of this, um, of this really important discussion about racism, and and really anyone who is has the motive or motivation to write an op-ed. I'd love to consider it for publication because you know we have a platform. It's meant to engage our citizens, and I, I would love to help people get their message out and encourage that conversation. Um, send it to me at editorial at we-ha.com. All right, and Paul, any last words before I say our goodbyes? Um, I, I'd be hard pressed to follow Lorna, honestly, but um, mm -hmm. I, wanna, I wanna just uh, reinforce what she said. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, it, I, I take that as uh, you know our personal charge as part of our mission to inspire and prepare kids. What are we preparing them for? We're preparing them for a global society. We're preparing them to be uh, good citizens. And, and that means to have that safe and healthy respect and, and look upon each other as human beings. Um, I want to, you know, I want to credit uh, the teachers that do this work day in and day out um, and the dedication and the bravery, you know, especially when you may not know all the right answers, but you just know it's the right thing to do to 
help educate yourself and take risks and put yourselves out there. So uh, I feel I feel very blessed to work in this district. Uh, there's no place I'd, I'd, I'd want to be otherwise because I feel like we focus on the right things. Uh, we set very high standards uh, for ourselves and uh, I'm just glad to be a part of it. So thanks. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we're grateful uh, for what you do, and we're grateful that you gave us uh, an hour of your time tonight to talk about it. We're going to want you back on uh, as the school year gets closer, because I think, uh, you know, there, there could be developments. I, we definitely want to stay on top of them. I'll be looking forward to the meeting next week to see what the details are. And uh, Dr. Farquharson, thank you so much. We really hope you'll come back on to, uh, you know, I speak for the town. Uh, we're grateful to have you and thank you for all that you do for uh, the Board of Ed and for the community. Um, Ronnie, I'm going to sign off for Ronnie Newton and John Lyons. I'm John Lyons. Uh, we will see you next week. Next week, we're going to be talking voting. Uh, we have the Essie Lebro and we've got the two registrars of voters for the town of uh, West Hartford. So we're going to be talking about mail-in voting and all things voting. So you definitely want to tune in next Thursday night. 6 p.m. WHCI TV, weha.com, neighbors and friends, and now statewide on uh, Connecticut News Junkie. Uh, thank you all very much, and we'll see you next time.